For the next few moments, I want to, to preach on the topic of from pain comes power. And if you turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, beginning at the 6th verse, it reads, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do say. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And if you turn also to Romans, the seventh chapter, the 14th verse, it reads, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Now, God, as I have called on you, you have always been there for me. I ask that you would allow me to be here as you have called me to be. Have you ever found yourself trying to do the right thing and meet unexpected hostility and opposition? Have you ever been made to feel as though the right people had been getting on the wrong nerve for just long enough that you had to give them a piece of your mind in the best and most eloquent way possible? While at the same time you wanted to operate in the context of the phrase that Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high. These moments come in many different ways, and many of us have developed innate senses that warn us when some stuff is about to jump off, and we have to prepare ourselves to respond with grace, dignity, and intelligence. We have to brush up on our corporate email appropriate uh, language, and we have to go digging for the receipts and the screenshots and prepare ourselves to let any and everybody that cares to know what somebody somewhere has messed up. We have to let everybody know that somebody somewhere has got us messed up and we ain't gonna take it. Second Corinthians to an extent is a letter from the Apostle Paul. Paul is writing to the church about some of the issues that have been brewing between them. He's trying to help them understand in a holy way that they had the wrong one. Is articulating to them in the most safe and sensified manner that he kept that he has undergone conversion, meaning that he has not always been saved. So try him if you want to. Yes, in fact, the church at Corinth is now making it so that Paul has to provide evidence and justification that he is who he says that he is, that he's about what he said that he's about, that he can produce what he has been preaching to them and writing to them about. He has to prove to them that he is a follower of Christ worthy of being listened to. And so what followed was Paul's authentic summary of his work as a missionary and the vision that he had and the lessons that he learned in the process. Now this is not to be confused with what we often do in the AME tradition of regurgitating the last annual conference.
conference report to prove our merit, but this was Paul saying that he had done the work, that he had been in the field, that he knows God for himself. The texts that have been highlighted are from the letters of Paul writing to the churches in Corinth that had grown respectively. In these texts, Paul is lifting up some of his personal issues with being an agent of Christ. And at the same time, he's grappling with the lesser desirable frustrations of his human fallibility. I believe that for each of us, there are moments where we are forced to reconcile within ourselves our perceptions of salvation and redemption and correlate it to this great mess that we call life. And then we have to weigh that against how are we to be followers of Christ, called to do the work of Christ with Christ here on earth to go and spread the message of salvation and redemption that we don't quite grasp ourselves. Yeah. Is mastery a prerequisite to service? In life, we're constantly forced to choose between good and evil. And while most of us would like to make everybody think that we're perfect and doting saints, this is not the truth. The more accurate truth is that each of us will have our own battles that will cause us great consternation as we seek to have the righteousness within us win out over the evil that presents itself all around us. And how sweet that evil can present itself to be. Church, the heart of the matter is that we were born into this sin sick and sin cursed world and mandated to live and operate differently from all that pervades our society. That, that's the challenge of being a disciple. How are we to exist within and around a message and society that exists counter to what we were called to be? It would be illogical to assume that this feat would be an easy one. The issues that we battle, the ones that, if exposed, would bring shame upon us and our families and our churches and our God are the very things we can understand to be the thorns in our side. Those issues that we cannot seem to shake free from that leave us praying to God that he would remove them from us. Paul writes about how this thorn in his flesh left him praying to God that it be removed from him three times. And there is a lot of debate and discussion as to what exactly Paul's thorn might have been. Mm -hmm. Some say that it was a physical distortion that would have caused him to walk differently or appear hunched or otherwise disabled. Some suggest that it could have been a problem with his eyesight, which would have made his work in organizing and witnessing to those new disciples difficult. Some say that it may have been a speech impediment that caused him to be ostracized and dismissed when he stood in front of the assembled crowds because his words did not live up to his presentation. Some say that his ailment could have been a disease that caused him pain and strife. It could have been his temperament where he was moved easily to anger and rebuke. It could have been depression. Whatever it was, we all too have our thorns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we all have those very things that make our service to God difficult and something that we would just as easily ignore. For some of us, our thorns emanate from personal choices and decisions that get in the way of our service to God. Yeah, yeah. For some of us, our thorns are habits and addictions that no matter how much we pray to be healed and delivered, we find ourselves right back where we started time yeah, and time yeah, again. Yeah. No matter how far we think we're moving beyond the situation, we keep finding ourselves in the beginning stages. For some of us, thorns are hurt that we have not healed from. For some of us, it's the expectations of others that we don't have the courage or confidence to tell them that we will never live up to or meet. It, it's interesting when we examine the parallels between these two texts that we could encounter a continuous theme. This theme begins with the, the expression of the limitations of humanity. 
as people who often get full of ourselves, we have a hard time accepting that there are happenings in our lives that we just can't control. And it's when we come up against these barriers that we can't seem to move beyond that we throw in the towel and walk away. It is when we just say, don't bother me with that no more. I gave you my answer. That's it. It's final. It's a done data. Stop. <laughs> it's interesting when we examine the parallels that we see what Paul was issuing with. Because it's when we have problems and plans that don't work out that we start to lash out. Unfortunately, too often our, when our plans don't work, we start to get righteous and indignant in our thinking that we know what's best and how things are supposed to go. It, it's a destructive path because we think we get dangerous and we pull others into our mess and they need to be left out of it while we deal with the things that we have to deal with. It's dangerous because more often than not, we are existing in our man or woman created hell, trying to find a savior when we are ignoring the very savior that we had. Yeah. We begin gaslighting, making others think that they're crazy and lashing out, blaming them for our failures, and we begin to fight a battle that exists because of ourselves, and that's when we begin to waver in our faith. When we have moments of difficulty, we give in to the defeat that seems as though it will always be looming over our heads because we could not find an easy solution. Yeah. We give in because we thought we made some progress, but yet here we are again. But only this time we're more frustrated, we're more depleted, and often more angry. When we run into this wall, we even indict God. Yeah. God, how could you let this happen to me? God, why would you put me in this situation? Yeah. God, I've been faithful. I don't deserve to be treated this way. God, why? Uh -huh. But very few times do we actually submit ourselves to what God is doing, orchestrating beyond the limits of our humanity. Yes. When we disconnect from God and turn our attention to the tangible things of this world, we begin to seek them for our validation and we drift further and further from the will of God. When we seek money and privilege and access instead of righteousness and a closer relationship with God, we hang our hats on a lamppost of dissatisfaction and agony. This is why the most important aspect of this passage in 2 Corinthians is God's Response. Yes, yes, yes. God's response is the reason we have to stop throwing in the towel before we've sought out God in the first place. God's response is the reason we have to stop allowing others to dictate the magnitude of our service. God's response is the reason we have something to hold our peace and let God fight our battles. God's response came as a reminder, as an encouragement, and as a warning, and as a threat. Yeah. God simply said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. How do you understand the work of God's grace in your moments of weakness? It's in weakness that we become desperate and search for answers. It's at our weakest when we're available yeah. to persuasion and distraction. It's in weakness that we allow temptation to take hold of our minds and direct us down a path that we know is not for us. Uh -huh. Through Throughout history, we can find evidence of choices that were made in weakness that were devastating to generations. It was through weakness that Africans were transported from yeah. the shores of yeah. their homeland, chained in the bottoms of ships to serve as free labor that built the economic might of the Western world. It was through weakness that the natives of this land were marched across the plains on a trail of tears so that their land might be stolen yeah. and appropriated for the execution of the work of the empire. It, it was through weakness that dogs and hoses were aimed at the poor and marginalized that sought to seek the protections of a country and assert their equality and right to be called human. Yeah. It was and is through weakness that black boys and black girls have been subjected to state-sanctioned violence yeah. on the streets of Ferguson and Baltimore and New York and all across this nation yeah. and all across this world. Yeah. It was through weakness that young black girls go missing and are sold into sex trafficking and nobody says a word. Wow. It's through weakness that the violence yeah. of the inner city is locked in cages as a result of yeah. tough on crime laws that have been passed by both major political parties that we yeah. still look yeah. to every election cycle. Yeah. 
to save us. It is through weakness that the mentally ill are left on the streets untreated and unmedicated. It is through weakness that the poor and destitute are ostracized and stepped over as we make our way to the malls and major shopping centers. Uh -huh. It's through weakness that the church has silenced the voices yeah. of yeah. young men and women seeking to realign the church with God's call because they would not conform to the ideologies of oppression and misappropriation. Yeah. It was through weakness that they in Corinth rejected and questioned Paul. It's in these moments of weakness that through our humanistic understanding we begin to cope. Coping is defined as facing and dealing with responsibilities and problems or difficulties, especially successful or in calm and adequate manner. That all sounds well and good, but until you get to the heart of the issue, we begin to understand that the process of coping is a process that's filled with limitations and disappointment. Yeah. It's important that as men and women of God, we understand that in order to deal with the impediments that we face, we cannot fall into the way of feeling as though we need to do is press on for the sake of pressing on. Negative coping is a distraction that draws us away from acting in accordance with the will of God. Yeah. When we cope, we become preoccupied with the distractions that are appealing to our sinful desires. We direct our time and attention towards acts that make us feel good. Uh -huh. We chase gratification and euphoria as opposed to deeper understanding and the meaning for our lives in Jesus Christ. Coping, this negative form of coping is a way of lifting oneself up so that they are not required to give their all to God. That we can remain in a place of perceived comfort according to our own standards because it does not require us to deal cognitively. We don't have to think about, we don't have to realize, we don't have to actualize the fact that we are, have realities taking place around us that we just can't handle. We get mad when we have to deal with the self-inflicted traumas and baggage that we carry around day in and day out. This storm is a reminder that we must rely on something greater than ourselves. This, this, this storm is a reminder that we ha have to address something that's missing within us. We have to realize that we were created by God to serve God, not by God, so that we could serve ourselves. The storm cannot cause us to rely on God on the, on the surface only, not in theory only. We have to submit ourselves. Reliance of something, something greater is articulated through Paul's writing in Romans 7, where he again decries his inability to seem to get it right. He's frustrated at, in that whenever, wherever, and however he tries to do the right thing, he finds himself doing wrong. But though he may be wrong, and though many of us may be struggling between our thorns on one hand and our desires to do better that remains elusive and unattainable on the other, the same message applies. That same message that was given to Paul, which is given to us, is God's grace. God's unmerited favor is sufficient. This is a message that focuses not on coping, but on growth. Yes. Growing in God with God is something that we should all strive to do. It allows us to relinquish our own goals and aspirations and trade them in for God's. When we begin to grow, we live a life of serving and sacrifice to God by joining in the work of Christ, by serving all those around us. Yeah. By growing, we begin to understand and appreciate that grace that we have been relying on for so long that we never quite understood. God's grace is such that it's been with you all along. <laughs> It protects you, it provides, it leads, yes, yes, and it yes. guides. When we are at our best and at our most ignorance, God's grace is still there. Yes. This beautiful thing called grace, which we cannot even comprehend, perfects God's power in our weakness. It's when we have been tested and tried yeah, and yeah. beaten down, but still somehow we make it to the other side that we can thank God for God's grace. Yes, it, yeah. it was God's grace that was th when there were those chained in the bottom of the slave ships and through their descendants, birth arts and culture and achievements of every kind. It was grace that was with those agitators seeking to lift their voice on 
behalf of the oppressed and the marginalized. God's grace was with Thomas L. Jennings. God's grace was with David Walker. God's yeah. grace was with Reverend Henry H. Barnett. God's grace was with Frederick Douglass. God's grace was with Dr. John S. Rock. God's grace was with him and Neil Turner. God's grace was with Richard Allen. God's grace was with Audrey Bell. God's grace was with W. C. Du Bois. God's grace was with John and so many important. God's grace was with William Steele. God's grace was with Lady Lou Hamer. God's grace was with James Baldwin. God's grace was with Langston Hughes. God's grace was with Harriet Tubman. God's grace was with So Turner the Truth. God's grace was with Catherine. God's grace was with Nat Turner. God's grace was with Asada and Marcus Garvey and Bobby Seale and Hugh Newton. They were with Bob Marley and two fine kids. Power will come from your weakness. 